Hi, my name's Pat Dudgeon. I'm a professor at the University of Western Australia. I'm um, the director of the Centre for Best Practice in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Suicide Prevention. I was really pleased to be a part of the Lifeline Report, Wellbeing and Healing Through cult Connection and Culture. It was important that we, um, it was an Indigenous-led report. We had um, a group of different uh, researchers and writers who all um, contributed to the report, but it is distinct in that it comes from an Indigenous uh, point of view, and um, it takes a critical um, position to look at healing and recovery for our people. So it is a very important report. I'm, um, I think that Lifeline should be commended uh, for undertaking a report like this, ensuring that it was um, in the hands of Indigenous people, that it was Indigenous-led, um, and it speaks to Indigenous realities and Indigenous pri priorities and aspirations. It's a report that looks at um, what's happened to us as a population, what needs to happen for us to recover and heal. We build on a lot of the um, research and reports that have been done around Indigenous suicide prevention, particularly um, community-driven uh, programs and um, reports. So that was really important for us because we know through our own research that, that there needs to be um, Indigenous governance and ownership of the issue also, um, cultural perspectives, they're, very, they're the two most important things in any undertaking to start looking at Indigenous suicide uh, prevention. So it was important that we were able to, um, to prioritise what we thought was important. And this will inform Lifeline and other services to deliver culturally competent and appropriate services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So it's a start. Um, I envisage that Lifeline will be engaging in a co-design process um, for whatever developments they do, whether it's uh, crisis lines, whether, whether it's tax lines or, or, or whatever. But we know that um, there is an urgent need for services. Our communities need all the support they can, um, that, that can be given to them, but it also needs to be done in a culturally appropriate manner. So I expect that the report will um, give a platform for a lifeline to engage in a proper process with Indigenous community to develop services um, that will meet their specific needs. And that will be a good, um, a very good thing. I think that with COVID-19, we've seen a change, everything's changed. That's been a big issue for all of us across the world. But now more than ever, um, there is a need for telemental health, digital mental health and other services that don't require face-to-face. -face. Obviously face-to-face -face is the best and a combination of that and digital mental health strategies but right now that is what we're relying on so, so it's a time that we can build these um, services in that after the pandemic is over that they will sustain and be part of a, a, a large um, range of offerings that we can make available to Indigenous communities. We believe that um, even before COVID, there was, there was a great unmet need in the communities, particularly people who are in remote and rural situations, but also in urban. You know, some people are um, embarrassed or they don't have the resources to get to a service, to get face-to-face -face, um, uh, mental health services. So uh, there is already a space for um, for tele and digital mental health services. I think the access is an important issue, whether you're in an urban situation or remote and rural, but also it, it gives um, particularly young people, um, we've found that young people are using services much more uh, because it's immediate and um, it, it, guarantee, it safeguards your confidentiality. So I think that that's a good start and um, from that, if people are me needing immediate help, they can get that. But also, if there's ongoing issues, that they will be um, uh, networked into an appropriate service and resources. So as long as uh, a challenge is before us, a good challenge, and I think a lot of the Aboriginal community control health services um, will be in, in, engaging in um, tele and digital mental health and it will be great to see Lifeline there being a partner in all that activity.
Lifeline has made a commitment to ensure not only co-design um, of their services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but also that they would be employing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander councillors. And that to me is very important. So we'll have a whole um, workforce being um, built and, and capacity built, trained to deliver those services. And that's important for us. And um, we're not, uh, we're unsure about how that will happen, but it may well be networks across the country. So that capacity building will be um, a national concern, which would be great. A big issue uh, for me and my experience in uh, leading this report is the commitment of um, big organisations like Lifeline to do genuine and proper co-design. Um, also that after this report, there will be a partnership made with the Aboriginal communities through Guy Dewey, through the Aboriginal Community Control Health organisations to, um, to co-design services, to employ Indigenous people and to ensure that Indigenous governance is an intrinsic part of the services that they offer. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing a new way of working come about and I applaud Lifeline for stepping up to um, the plate and taking that forward.